So I've got an outline here of seven points from verses one to 11. I've broken it down into seven points. And there's some sub points too. And I'll go through those. The first main point that we talked about was the dinner. And that was the, the uh, in fact, let me do, let me do this. Let me read verses one through, in fact, you know what? No, Pat, Pat will read verses one through 11 because he's eloquent and intelligent and I like to hear him read. Somehow I knew I was going to get this job. <laughs> but one through 11, right? One through 11. I just got my brand new prescription glasses. Oh, there you go. Hopefully I won't break my glasses this time. One through 11, John 12. Okay. Um, New American Standard Version. Uh, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly per perfume, of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, about the poor but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore, Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Okay, so what I want to do is I'd like to break those that section down into seven points. And then I'm going to give you the main points, but if you're writing this down, leave some room for sub points. And I'll go under this, I'll go to the sub points after that. The first one point is the dinner. The dinner. The second point is the demographic. The demographic. The third point is the devotion. The devotion. The fourth part is the deceiver, the deceiver. The fifth point is the defense, the defense. The sixth point is the demand. And the seventh point is the design. Okay, so under under these these main seven main points, there are sub points. Now the dinner. The dinner point sub point A is in honor of Christ. The dinner was done in honor of Christ. Those who are true disciples of Christ seek to honor him. And this was the case. Subpoint B under the dinner is uh, in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So it's in the home of his disciples. Christ is all. 
always welcomed in the home of his disciples. And so um, is your home a welcome place for Christ? It's a good question to ask yourself. Whether you're single or whether you're married, it doesn't matter. Is your home a welcomed place for Christ? Point C under the dinner, which is the main point one, is outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city of God, and yet God was only welcomed outside of it. And that leads us to point two, the demographic, and the subpoints under that, we have three, A, B, and C. One is there was a demographic there. There was first the disciples. Then there was the leaders or slash opposition. And three, point three under the point two is the seekers. So there was the disciples who were committed to Christ, the Pharisees or the opposition to Christ, and then those who were genuinely seeking. They're in search for hope. Then under point three, the devotion, is we have one, Mary's true worship, and two, Mary's prophetic act. And, and by the way, when I get to the end of these, if you guys have any questions about them, let's talk about that. Okay? And three, Mary's sacrifice. Then under main point for the deceiver, we have three points, A, B, and C. A is he denounces the true disciple. B, he reveals his lack of priority. And remember, because what Pat just read, he had already intended to betray Christ. So even before anything, he already in his mind had rejected Christ and had intended to betray him. So he reveals his lack of priority. And three, or C, he, he's, he secretly desires to enrich himself. Or you could also say he longs to please the flesh. Then you have point number five, the defense. Jesus rebukes Judas's attitude. Jesus commands, this is point B, sub point B, Mary's worship. Sub point C, Jesus reveals the Spirit's work in her. Then under point, uh, main point six, the demand for Jesus. Um, there's two sub points, A and B. Jews in hope seek him out. And point B, Jews in controversy seek him out. And under uh, main point seven, the design of the Jews. We have five subpoints. One is out of jealousy. Two is out of fear. 
Three is out of unbelief. Four is out of pride. And five is out of power. Okay, I'm back. Any questions? Because I don't think we went all the way to 11 last week. No, we, we to went six. to chapter six, I mean, verse six. Verse six, that's what I thought, okay. Well, let me... Um... We stopped at verse six, which is, he did not, uh, let's see. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, uh, and this is interesting because in some of the versions it says he was intending to betray him. So I think that that's interesting, the verbiage there that there was already in the, what was it about Judas, even though he saw all those miracles, that he still was going to betray Christ? And it was, I think it really honestly was because he had, a, he had a design or an expectation of what the Messiah should be. He wanted the here and the now. And like a lot of the televangelists, you know, he wanted his flesh to be fulfilled, not his spirit. So anyway, um, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. So that's a kind of an interesting perspective. And that is not everyone that has a charitable attitude is necessarily has a charitable heart. And I think that that's, I think that's interesting because in our world today, um, in our world today, we, he, oh, this is an interesting thing. I walked in, I, I go to the gym in the morning. I'm trying to work out early in the morning, about five in the morning, I get to the gym. And I walked into the, the sauna to kind of do my stretches and whatnot. And there was a guy there and he was talking to another guy. The other guy had broken, he was an older man. They were both older men. And the other guy had broken his back. I'm not sure how, but I get the sense that it was just a tragic kind of incident. And so he was experiencing a lot of pain. And when I got into the sauna, he said, could you help me up? I broke my back and I can't get up without help. So I helped him up and he sat up. And this other guy began to go on and on about, you know what? You control your own destiny. Whatever you say, you can make happen. You know, and he was Asian and he was speaking not from a Tony Robbins self-help attitude, but he was speaking from an Eastern mentality. And I said, look, I have to disagree with that. And I, I just started preaching the gospel. And it was really interesting that that guy, at first he wanted to debate me, but almost immediately he got up and left. He did not want to debate because I, I told him, I said, how do you explain the Holocaust? If, if you're in control of everything and if you get everything you deserve, how do you explain innocent women and children going into the furnace? Why didn't they control that? And he got up and left because he just he had no explanation for that. And what was really what I found interesting is that what he was saying was very similar. And he was saying it from a very Asian, Eastern, yin and yang type of mentality. But what I found very interesting, it was almost the exact same thing that Joel Olstein and Tilton and a lot of these other false teachers say. 
And uh, so I began to, I just began to preach the gospel and I began to preach that God was the creator and he was the one in control and you're not in control and that we're out of control and that we need him and that we were created to glorify him. And, you know, because the guy asked me, well, why don't you answer me? Um, what, what is the reason for our existence? He said, I told them the reason for your existence is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that's when he got up and walked out because he didn't like that answer. But it was really interesting that we, I had this conversation with this man with the broken back. And then I, I left and I went into the uh, jacuzzi. After I worked out, I went into the jacuzzi because, you know, muscles are sore. And this man walked up to me and he grabbed my hand and he said, thank you. Everything you have said makes sense. And I think that what I need is God. So this, people don't want to accept. People like Judas, they want their flesh fulfilled. They, they have a picture of, of a Messiah, and, and, it, and look, it's no different from the Pharisees. The Pharisees wanted a Messiah that would bring them glory, not ask them to suffer. And so Judas basically denounces Mary. And this is what happens. False disciples do not like true disciples. They don't. Why, why do you see so much hostility towards John MacArthur? And I believe it's because he simply just says the truth. Look at this guy. He's like probably 80-something years. I, I tell you, when, when this guy dies, we're really in a pickle. We don't, you know, we got some Vody Bachmans out there and we got R.C. Sproul's gone. MacArthur's getting up there in age. But the false disciples denounce the true disciples. They don't like it. And then he reveals... He reveals what he's really after. He's really after his own greed. And if you look at these false teachers, the Benny Hins and the Robert Tiltons and the Kenneth Copelands and the Joel Olsteins, what are they after? Well, they're after money. Very obvious. But Tony, I have the question about Judas and greed. It really was not a whole lot of money, was it? Well, say that again? It really was not a whole lot of money, was it? The perfume? No, the 30 things that he was given. Like we were talking about why did Judas denounce Jesus and there are different reasons, but but his own greed, he really didn't make that much money by denouncing no. Christ. Listen, if you think about it, people are willing to degrade themselves for nothing. For nothing. Think about how many times you've chosen to sin and how unprofitable that sin was mm -hmm. and how much it cost you. Mm -hmm. And how you you look at it now and go that how stupid, what what a complete waste of you know time and energy. But yeah, and we have to be careful because Judas was a prophetic figure. The thirty pieces of silver was prophetic. Mm 
-hmm. But the principle I think is there. Mm -hmm. And that is that sin has very little payoff. Mm -hmm. Good point. Hey, Tony, can I ask really quick, isn't it fair to say that uh, Judas was looking to be in power, right? I mean, he was looking to uh, be a ruler. Like well, in his lifetime, or in his lifetime, rather. I, I don't know. I think it would be more fair to say that, that, that John and James and Peter were looking to have power. But because they were they had a true faith, they were willing to give that up. They realized that that was a fool's errand. Judas wanted money. Now, whether that equates to power or not, I don't know. But I do know this. Money equates to security. And either your security is in Christ or your security is in money. And Judas chose that his security would be in money and not in the Christ. So where do you get your security from? We went out to dinner last night with my son and I was just talking about where our country is and all that. And he's like, dad, you're, come on, you're depressing me, you know, we want to, I said, look, I said, Jake, you cannot hide from the reality of what's going on. And I'm not saying that you can't enjoy life, but at the same time, your hope has to be in, in the coming of Christ. Don't pin your hopes on the here and the now. Jesus told his disciples to, 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 to be on the watch and to have an expectation of the times and the signs of the times. And I told them, I said, look, I know, you know, you're married and you're going to have a baby and I, I get all that. And you can still enjoy all that. But know that hard times are going to come. But even in those hard times, the grace of God is, will overwhelm those hard times. No matter how the world <clears throat> tries to make you suffer, the grace of God will bring you to the point of joy. Paul was never more filled with joy than when he was chained and beaten in a prison. The grace of God always overcomes in a, 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 a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What do you call merciful? it? Merciful? Not just merciful, but what do you call it with something like you make an investment and then it just goes like this because of the way? Exponentially. Exponential. Thank you. The grace of God is an exponential factor over suffering. And as I, I you can enjoy life now even though you know how bad things are why because of god's grace and i guarantee you there's a very good possibility that some of you here will die in prison because of your belief in christ that that's not out of the spectrum the fbi the doj is completely corrupt. They're Nazi. They're like Nazis in the way that they're they're dealing with conservative people or pro-life people or Christian people. And it's only going to get worse. It doesn't take long for a for a country to fall into. Look at Nazi Germany. It does not take long 
for people to allow such horrible atrocities to happen. You can say, well, you know, are we going to criticize the Germans? No. Everyone has that in their heart as a sinner. And whenever you let evil prosper because you reject the truth of God, the very heart of evil is there waiting to take, whether it's Stasi or Nazi or Stalinist or, you know, like the Chinese communists, whatever, North Korean, whatever it is, it's there waiting to oppress and to kill off truth. <clears throat> but you can't fear that. As a believer, you have to believe in the grace of God. And that even if you're in a jail, in fact, I will say this, the more you suffer as a Christian, the more joy you will have in your life. That's the truth. And if you are, if you're seeking Christianity so that you can have a comfortable, cushy life, you're barking up the wrong tree. What makes Christianity wonderful is that in despite all the suffering that you're going to endure as a believer, suffering which is designed to draw you closer to Christ, by the way, your joy and your satisfaction and your fulfillment in life will be more than you could ever, ever expect. It just doesn't come the way the world says it comes. Judas thought that his joy and security were going to be found in money. Mary believed her joy and security were found at the feet of Christ. And that is, um, that's the truth. We have to understand that. So then... <clears throat> You have this defense that Jesus gives. He says, leave her alone. It's very, okay, that's very interesting. Because that's a rebuke. Leave her alone. Jesus will always defend his followers. Then he says, it was meant that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will know, not always have me. So, one, Jesus rebukes Judas. He comes to the defense of Mary. And you have to understand something, you guys, that, that women, women were garbage in this, at this time. They were treated like garbage. They had no one to defend them. If someone criticized a woman, no one was going to come to her defense because she was garbage. We don't under, I don't think we really understand how Christ elevated and brought to the reality, to the forefront, the value of women. And I'm not saying this as being someone who's been affected by feminist ideology in our culture. I'm saying this because this is the truth. You know what really boggles my mind? Islam 
Islam absolutely degrades women. Why do American feminists say nothing about that? Why does Ilhan Omar, who is knows how much they degrade women, who's a congresswoman, given every opportunity to be a woman of power by men, white men who voted her in, and she says nothing about the horrific attitude of Islam towards women. It really boggles my mind. Which why she's evil. She's an evil person. That's why. And she's bent on deception. That's why she doesn't say anything about that. And feminism, feminism in America has not been designed to combat Islamic misogyny. It's been designed to combat Christian white male perspective. And it doesn't seem that they have the ability to look at in a fair manner what's going on in the other countries in the world against women. But if you look at Christ, if you look at Paul, if you look at scriptures, Christ, Christ rightly brings women back in the role that God has designed them to be in. Uh, I just really think it's interesting. The Bible is called misogynistic when the Bible, when Christ and Paul, especially um, through the preaching of the gospel, brings back the dignity of women the, and brings back the understanding of woman's role to glorify God. But It's just a sad, it's just a sad, it's a sad thing. So Jesus rebukes Judas, then Jesus commends her worship. She's done this for me. It was meant that she should say, so hold on, listen to what he says. It was meant that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Mary's perfume was specifically set aside by God to be used as an act of worship for Christ. But guess what? Mary, this perfume was worth, in today's, in, let's say in California's standard, about $120,000. Okay, she that perfume was meant to be her retirement. It was meant to help her to be able in her old age to be able to pay for things with that perfume. It was like gold or silver. It was a commodity. And yet she took her whole future. She took her whole future and poured it on the feet of Christ. What was she saying? She was saying, this isn't my security. This isn't my future. You, Christ, are my security and my future. And Judas was pissed because he didn't believe that. That's the amazing act of worship for Mary. So there's a challenge here for us. Are we willing to pour out our future? See, now, if I was Robert Tilton, I'd say, pour out your future, you know, into my bank account. Go ahead and get all your money. <laughs> Is that that's how they would read this? <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> you need to take all your savings, give it to me, and that'll show that you trust the Christ <laughs> and buy another mansion. But the fact is, what is your future, and are you willing to pour it on the feet of Christ?
where's your security? For some people, it's money. For some people, it's relationships or family. For some people, it's whatever. So you got to you got to ask yourself that. But also, G, after G, Jesus rebukes Judas's attitude and Jesus commends Mary's worship, which is prophetic, by the way, it's prophetic. She's in line with the Holy Spirit. Jesus reveals the Spirit's work in her. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. He reveals that the Spirit is at work within Mary by the fact that she's worshiping, by the fact that this oil or perfume was saved by her for Christ. She didn't know it, but the Spirit knew it. That's all part of it. Then we have, I want to hit the last two points here, the demand for Jesus. You had a few different people that were there. Basically, you had, you had the people that were there seeking for hope. They wanted to know the Messiah. They wanted to know hope. Then you had other people there that were just there for the spectacle. Oh, what did I do with my pen? Tony? Yes. Okay, I have a question. So how would you speak to the point about where's you know, you know, people would want to know, okay, where's the balance between like what Mary did, you know, and, and, and showed in a really honorable way that she is her entrusting her life to Jesus. That's what she was doing. But at the same time, doesn't say in the Bible that, you know, you can't sit and waste away, you know, well, that's not the same thing exactly, but there, you know, that, that things don't happen magically either. You have to, um, uh, you know, uh, put to work your talent, so to speak, in that, you know, the, they use it in a different, you know, sense, but, you know, use what you're given as another way to, um, you know, make the best of your life because of all that you've been given by Jesus. In other words, so how would you, you speak to people and say, okay, well, if that's true, I'm just going to give up my, uh, everything I have, and sit here and wait for Jesus to take care of me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I yeah, I do. I think the issue here is we need to look at what's going on. Yeah. This is a specific incident that required sacrifice. Okay, the other day I had one of my students, um, Kevin Toke, he's an, uh, he's a musical artist. Um, I had another student, I don't um, know if you've ever heard of him. His name is Michael Busby. Michael Busby wrote music for, he, he was actually, Michael Busby was on, uh, on um, The Voice. Uh, he's a producer, a musical writer. He grew up in Concord, California. He was in my college group as a young man. He became a, he's a very famous songwriter, made hundreds of millions of dollars as a songwriter. Um, unfortunately, two years ago, he, he has three little girls, a wife, he got brain cancer and he died. But he was a big influence on Kevin. Kevin was another one of my college students who was in the same church at the time. Kevin's a very gifted musical artist. Kevin Tope is his name. He's starting a ministry because he realized that a lot of the record labels were really taking advantage of Christian artists and basically fleecing them for all the money they could get out of them. And so he started a ministry to disciple Christian artists and to help produce their music so that they could make a living and glorify God. And he came to our house and basically asked us if we would support him. 
and of, of course we're going to support him he i i remember i remember holding him while he was crying when he was 19 years old and praying with him and now he's in his 30s with a wife and kids and this is what I'm saying. There are situations, there are times when God asks you to sacrifice, right? Um, it's not about selling everything you have and giving it to a charity and, you know, that, no. As a father for me, I want to, I, I want to leave something for my son. I want to leave him an inheritance. I want both spiritually and economically. The Bible actually talks about that. But when, but when Christ brings someone to my door that needs money or that needs help, or maybe they just maybe they just need their furniture taken out of a out of a storage facility somewhere and uh, hauled away to the goodwill, <laughs> then you're there. You're supposed to be there, giving your resources to other believers, giving your resources to the Lord. And hopefully you're looking for those opportunities that when they present themselves, that you're not like, oh, I'm inconvenienced. No, this is an opportunity to worship God. This is an opportunity to bless a brother or sister in Christ. And that's, you know, the lesson that Mary has there is that every act of sacrifice is an act of worship towards God. Every act of giving is an act of worship towards God. I get to, I get to have fun and I get to teach, but then Pat has to go and edit everything, put everything on YouTube. He doesn't get anything for that. He's not getting any money. He's not getting any, anything for that. Why is he doing that? His motivation is to glorify God. And yeah, he's crazy. I know. <laughs> is to glorify God and to further the gospel. So, the, you know, it's about, it, it's about when God presents himself to you. To me, that's, that, that's what it's about. Are you ready? When, when there is a need, are you ready to fulfill it? Are you ready to make a, a, a sacrifice? Are you ready to inconvenience yourself? You know, I think that's a big part of it. Okay. So, so then let me, I want to, I want to hit these last two points. To, oh, sorry. Dropped my dog. Um, to verse 11, and that's the demand of Jesus. There were Jews, there were those people who were seeking him out. There were authentic, sincere people who wanted to know the Messiah. And then there were Jews who were just looking for controversy. They wanted to see a spectacle. And I'm gonna just be honest with you. I see this as a division between those who seek after these charismatic televangelists, they want controversy. They want a spectacle. They want their flesh fulfilled. They want to be rich and healthy and wealthy. And between those who seek expositional teaching and preaching of God's word, because they want to know Christ. They want their security in Christ, not in emotions, not in feelings, but in Christ. So there's, there's definitely a comparison there. Then the seventh and last point is the design of the Jews. And that's five things that they were seeking to destroy Christ. It was one out of jealousy. Because they claimed to be godly, but he was. Two out of fear. They didn't want to lose their position. Because for them, their security was not in God. Their security was in their money and their wealth and their position. And then C, out of unbelief. They simply had no faith. And then D, out of pride. They, want, they wanted to be worshipped. They didn't want God to be worshipped. They wanted to be worshipped. 
And then E, the fifth point and last is out of power. They wanted to keep their power. Okay. So that brings us to 11. Now, ne next, next week, I've got this all ready outlined. Um, when I, want to do, week, right? I want to do an overview of the triumphal entry of Christ. I think there'll be some things in there you'll be surprised to know. Hey, Tony, we, we are not meeting next week, though. Is that right? Oh, that's right. We're not. 